my name is Stephen Neal, so I'm a product manager for 3D at Nearmap, and I come from a, a background of GIS, so Geographic Information Systems, and I've worked with a lot of spatial data over the years. Uh, I've spent quite a bit of time working with car navigation data sets, and I've really become quite interested in 3D uh, over my time at Nearmap, which has been about 18 months now. And I think it represents for me a, a really good convergence of technology. So we have this world of GIS and, and there are some elements of 3D and spatial analysis there. And we have the world of CAD and the design that goes into some of the CAD packages. Then we have uh, the visualization and the animation tools that it really come out of the, um, you know, the cinema industry and animation gaming and that sort of thing. It's a whole new aspect of 3D content and we're seeing different elements of that, uh, those industries come together in what we're doing today. And it's that combined with computing technology, graphics cards uh, in computers becoming a little bit more accessible, the increased speed of networks, so it wouldn't be possible for us to do what we're doing without good um, bandwidth and connections and that is actually necessary for you as well to be able to uh, view our content and download it quickly. It was in 2009 that Nearmap um, created its imagery as a service product and I think this week marks a really important milestone in the timeline of Nearmap's history because we are now doing what we did with 2D with 3D by making it available online and, and very simple to interact with. And we didn't stop there. We know that uh, exporting content is necessary when it comes to 3D because everyone has their own specialised applications that they use for doing certain analysis in or their design work. Um, the world in 3D is still a very diverse one. Um, we do have 23,000 square kilometres of 3D content in Australia. Uh, we have 3D content in the US as well, so we have 99,000 square miles of content in the US. It's a lot of content when you think about it. The important point for us is making access to our content simple. And I like to refer to this very simple workflow of explore, export, import. If you can just draw a circle around a searched location in the map browser, then you can click export and if that area is one square kilometre or so, something, something small, you will literally be working with that content locally in minutes. If you are doing a bigger export, then we can do up to 50 square kilometres in a single export out of our map browser application. It could take up to four hours, so there's quite a bit of content that is present there if you're looking at 50 square kilometres. And it also does depend a little bit on the, the formats that you use and obviously it's dependent on your network connection. Um, you know, I talk about one square kilometre, 50 square kilometres, what does that really look like? Uh, so I just went into the map browser and drew a polygon around the greater sort of CBD area of Sydney here. Um, so just around Circular Quay, out to Piermont. Um, <coughs> out to Woolloomooloo on the right hand side there and so I've covered that sort of pretty significant CBD area there. That's about eight square kilometres. So if we think about eight square kilometres compared to 50 square kilometres uh, in a single export, it gives you an idea for, for just how much you can download in, in one export. Now we do have 23,000 square kilometres in Australia, so if you are interested in getting all that content, we can also deliver offline, and I think that's probably the fastest way to get a huge amount of content like that. Um, you can, of course, do multiple 50 square kilometre exports if um, you wanted to accumulate more of that content, but only access it at certain times. So we're going to go through some scenarios today, and the purpose behind that is to uh, reinforce this explore, export, import style of workflow. Um, but I'm also going to talk about the individual products that we have available via our map browser application, but also offline as 3D as well. 
Uh, so that's the DSM, so the digital surface model. This is actually a, it's really a 2D layer, so it's a raster layer of elevation values. And if you query each pixel in that layer, it will return an elevation value. So it's really just a 2D layer, but it has that height information in there. The perfect partner to that DSM product is our true ortho product. It's also a 2D product, so it's, an, it's just an image. But this is an image where all of the building lean has been removed. So if you've been looking at our images in the CBD and you see the building lean that changes between captures uh, and it's been a bit annoying for some reason, well, this is a great product because it removes all building lean. So it's like flattening the mesh or, or just taking the true vertical pixel as you move around a scene. And that means that rooftops are spatially correct and consistent between captures. So it's a really good product for uh, just having that consist consistent spatial reference, but it also aligns pixel to pixel with our DSM product. So if you use the DSM, make it transparent and display the true ortho product underneath it, there's a pixel to pixel alignment, which means you can see what you're measuring. And I think that's quite useful as well. I'll talk about the textured mesh. I think this is uh, the product that people have seen most. Uh, it's the one where we show our fly-throughs and um, you see good visualizations in. We'll talk a little bit about the textured mesh. And then I'll go into the point cloud as well. Actually, I'm going to start with the point cloud. And our point cloud comes in the LAS format. Uh, if you have used LiDAR point clouds, then you'll be familiar with this LAS format. The difference between a LiDAR point cloud and ours is that the LiDAR point cloud has intensity values associated with um, those points. We don't have intensity values, but we do have an RGB value, so you can see colour in our point cloud. So similar um, products, same format, different method for creating them. So we're going to start with exploring our area of interest. And there's this site, the Future Transport Strategy, is a website for New South Wales which outlines some of the big infrastructure projects that are happening in New South Wales at the moment. Um, and you know, Sydney, it's growing quickly. And I think there's a date on this website somewhere, but I feel like this is just something that will continue. Um, it is always growing. There will always be infrastructure projects here to handle that, that population growth and the increasing density. Looking through that website, I came across uh, this M4 update project, and I think the M4 has been um, constantly upgraded since I've been around it. But there is a project here, it's a pretty big project, that's about 35 kilometres between Granville and Lapstone. So a pretty big uh, project to upgrade the M4. Now, if you were a business, an organisation that's involved in these sorts of infrastructure projects, um, you might be familiar with this e-tendering site, the New South Wales e-tendering site. And if on a Monday morning, say, you came into work and you got a notification for a new project, like uh, something like the, the M4 upgrade project, it's really a race against time. You know, your competitors are also looking into this project. You want to be informed. You want to develop your response for this tender. So any way that you can maximise your time means more time for your estimators, your planners, your designers to start preparing this response. And that will ultimately give you the, the best chance of success for winning a project like this. Now, I went to that site and I looked for that M4 upgrade project and I found uh, a package that's related to that project. There's about 30 pages of text in there. I found this one page um, which has some maps on there which tells you a bit about where these projects are and, and what's happening. It's not a lot of information. Um, so what are you going to do next? Well, you need to be informed uh, about what you might be working with. So you need to obtain content in order to start um, preparing your response and looking at options for designs on something like this. So what do we do? We go into the map browser and I've just got this video here which shows how um, we can go from our 2D view, which you might be familiar with in the new map browser, into the 3D view. You can search your location on the top left hand corner there 
and I've searched in this case for the beginning of this project, which is around Granville here. We can switch to 3D. So our 3D scene renders. And the first thing you do when you go into 3D is you tilt it and you start rotating it around because you, you want to see things from a perspective that is natural to you. We can do some simple measurements uh, in here. So we have a measurement tool um, that allows you to just start to get an idea of the relative size of objects. So there's this initial process of exploring and understanding the area that you might be dealing with. All of our content is available here. We have the captures down the bottom. So we have annual captures at the moment of 3D content. We may increase that to two captures or three captures next year. Now I've now searched to the end of that project, which is Lapstone. So you know we've got all of that content, the whole 35 kilometers there, ready to search and explore. Quite a different area, Lapstone, so the topography and the vegetation is significantly different to Granville. And if necessary, you could move and look at all 35 kilometres of that uh, roadway to see what you might be working with. So this is how we just start to explore our content. Now, I'm going to pause there and just focus on this measurement tool uh, a little bit. So, you know, this is only the beginning of our 3D experience. We do uh, expect to build up more tools over time. The first tool we wanted was this measurement tool. And it gives us three things. So it gives us the linear measurement from beginning to the end of that line. So just an obvious measurement from start to end. It also has the pitch. So for anyone who's been using our Obliques product, which has a pitch tool in there. Um, we also have a similar measurement available in 3D. Now, the 3D content is actually derived from those oblique images. So really, you can get a higher accuracy measurement from the obliques, because that's the source photo used to create this content. But there's also a simplicity associated with this measurement. So, if you're not needing that sort of survey level accuracy, you can uh, interact with this content, make simple measurements and understand what you're doing in, in a simpler way. So it has this little disk um, to use as a guide for understanding the surface of the texture that you're on. So if you imagine the peak of a roof, that disk will move across the peak of the roof and you can understand where you're measuring from. Especially if you're in a very tilted scene, it's hard to know sometimes where you're starting and finishing that line. So that disk just helps you understand the surface that you're on. We also have the relative height. So that's just the, the difference between the start and the end elevation of that measurement. And I think that's quite handy because it allows you to be almost sloppy with your measurements and you can still understand the, the vertical height of objects without needing to see the very bottom of the building or the, the very um, top of the corner of the gutter, for example. So I think it's a very useful tool, even though it's a very simple tool for just measuring and interacting with our content. So we've explored our content in the map browser. Now we get to exporting that content. So we know uh, that a lot of your work is done in third party applications. So we want to make that as easy as possible. So we're in our 3D scene here. The actual um, drawing of the area of interest for your export has to be done from the 2D environment because it gets quite difficult if you have uh, a lot of tilt in your 3D scene to start drawing uh, 2D vectors. So we go into the 2D view, you can outline your area of interest here. In this case, I'm starting up around this intersection uh, in Granville. We have these options on the right hand side and that includes the capture date. So if there's multiple dates available for that area, you can choose which date, whether it's the latest date or perhaps you're interested in something that's uh, historical. You have the different product options here. So textured mesh, point cloud, DSM, true ortho and the different formats that are available in this case for textured mesh only. You can tick all four of those products if you want and download it um, 
as part of the same initial export. You can give it a name, you hit continue and you get this confirmation dialog box here. So what's happened now is we've sent a job out to our AWS servers. That job's gone out, the processing and the export of that mesh is happening in the background. While that's processing, your notification box here will just say running. And later on, it will update and you'll see this ready to download option appear. And then you can just click on that option, there'll be download links available there. And just to sort of complete that scenario, in this case, I've downloaded an SLPK uh, format for the textured mesh scene layer package. And this is ArcGIS Earth, so it's a free application. You can just drag that content straight into ArcGIS Earth and all of a sudden, within minutes, you're working in a third-party application using the tools that you're familiar with or the tools that you need to get your job done. Now, I will say that I'm am proud of our engineers who have worked on this because the traditional process for accessing that content has been quite laborious and quite slow. Um, this is pretty cool functionality, I think, to be able to get access to your content very quickly. So going into a bit more detail now about those formats. So for the textured mesh, we have the 3MX and the SLPK and the OBJ. The, the 3MX and the SLPK, they're sort of similar in their format. And what's good about those formats is that they store a spatial reference. That's part of the file format. So it means when you use that product in an application, it will come and be positioned correctly. They're also streamable, and so they hold different levels of detail in those formats. And that means you can export a very large area, you can zoom in and out on that layer, and your system resources will handle the different levels of detail well. So just a regular computer, uh, you don't need a supercomputer with lots of RAM and some insane graphics card to look at that content. It will work very well with just a standard, standard equipment. You'll also notice that the size is quite different between some of those formats. So we're looking at 500 megabytes per square kilometer for the 3MX format. It's very efficient in terms of its storage size, uh, especially compared to the OBJ format. Now the OBJ, um, you'll see that I've got this 1,000 by 1,000 meter tile. It is a tiled form of OBJ because uh, it only holds this single level of detail. And that means that um, the RAM necessary to load a, a scene in OBJ quickly gets out of control as soon as you uh, go to larger and larger scenes. So, when you draw an area of interest, you'll get this tiling that happens that's aligned to a grid. You'll get all these different tiles come out. You'll also see there that the size is nearly triple, so it's one, one, nearly one and a half gigabytes per square kilometer. So there's a lot of content to deal with. But the, the love and the hate that we have with OBJ is that it's also very um, widely accepted by applications. So it's a very historical format. It's been, um, it's been around for a long time. If there's a chance that any format will be accepted by an application, OBJ will be it. So that's textured mesh. We also have the point cloud in that LAS format, um, quite variable in its size per square kilometre. Smaller tiles because it's very dense data. Then we have our DSM and our true ortho products that are in the GeoTIFF format. So the GeoTIFF is quite handy. It's accepted by many GIS applications. It has the spatial format uh, referenced in the file system. Um, and so it's very simple to use. So that's the, the DSM, the true author, the point cloud, and the textured mesh. Looking at those uh, products and some expected download time, so this is definitely dependent on your connection speed. We reference 100 megabits per second here. Uh, if you have a slower connection, it, it is going to be difficult. If we start with the, the DSM and the True Ortho here, for about a seven and a half gigabyte file, we're looking at 20 to 30 minutes of processing time. So that's when that job gets sent off. It's just processing in the background. Then it's about 10 minutes to download after that. It's not too bad, seven and a half gigabytes. 
you've got it within 30 to 40 minutes. If we go a bit bigger into the textured mesh format, we've got 70 gigabytes there. And so now we're looking at about an hour or so of processing and up to sort of an hour and a half to download. Uh, but like I mentioned, it's good. You can close the uh, browser application. You can close your laptop. You can let that process and download overnight. Uh, you don't need to be there. And that information and the history will be stored there for you to access. And I did just make a note there that one square kilometre will take about five minutes. Okay, so we've dealt with the exploring, the export, and now we get up to the importing into a third-party application. So I will run through uh, these different scenarios and some different applications that you might use with some of these different product types. And I wanted to make a note here just on the point cloud, and that's that these development applications, they are very costly. When you go through this process as a business, you're taking a risk. And the ultimate success of that project is really dependent on the, uh, the, the success of the business and, and the profitability of the business. Um, conversely, local government or state government, they really uh, realise the objectives of their, their planning through compliance of these developments. So you've got this people applying for these development applications and you've got people assessing the development application, the both sides of these development applications. In this case, we're going to look at Autodesk InfraWorks. It seems to handle a point cloud quite well. And I know that it's quite popular amongst many people. And I've got this workflow here that shows just exporting a point cloud for your area of interest. And then we have to use Autodesk Recap to import that LAS format and convert it to an RCP format. That RCP format can then be imported into Autodesk InfraWorks, and then you can use the tools within InfraWorks to mock up your options, um, look at different scenarios. And the final stage of that would be to sort of publish or communicate your results to either the business or in your response. So this is Autodesk Recap. Um, I don't think it's a great application for visualising point clouds but it's a necessary step uh, to make things easier. What it will do is take the various tiles of the LAS format, so if you have a, a large area, it'll take all those different tiles and convert them into a single RCP file. That RCP file can then be imported into Autodesk InfraWorks and you have all the tools available within InfraWorks uh, to look at your different options and developments. Now, I'm not a designer, but I tried my best here to show what a development may look like in this area. We can build up those different types of buildings, those different objects that you might use. We can look at it from different angles and understand the impact of that development on the surrounding environment. And then I wanted to just show uh, what a visualisation looks like here. So it really helps people to understand when you move about this content, turn those options on or off. Uh, it allows people to visualise and understand what you're working with here. I think that the point cloud renders quite well in InfraWorks. You saw in Recap, it's a little bit sort of pixelated. Um, it almost looks like textured mesh when you're in InfraWorks. It seems to handle the visualisation of that point cloud quite well. Um, but it is just points that we're working with here. So we can turn these buildings on and off. You can see what it looks like from a different angles. And the final thing I wanted to do here was just to zoom right in so you could see the spacing of those points. <clears throat> so now it becomes evident what we're sort of dealing with here. And all of our 3D products are based on a 15 centimetre GSD, so a 15 centimetre ground sampling distance. That is the geometry that gets built in our textured mesh product. The textures that we use are actually 7.5 centimetres or better. So if you're looking at textures, you can see a higher level of detail there. But the geometry itself is built around that 15 centimetre ground sampling distance. The point cloud is using that 15 centimetre sampling. And our DSM and our true ortho products are using a 15 centimetre pixel in them. So that's consistent through the products. 
So going into a different product this time, the DSM, and I wanted to really highlight um, the way that you can pull out information from our digital surface model. We often look at the visualization of textured mesh, but the value of the information you can derive uh, from our DSM product is, is really quite uh, impressive, I think. I know that there is legislated requirements for people to manage vegetation, especially around power lines. Uh, there's a high risk to bushfires whenever you have vegetation encroachment on power lines and, and there have been significant bushfires as a result of trees falling and interacting with those power lines. Uh, we also see examples like this. Um, this was Adelaide in October last year where a tree has fallen across the railway line and um, you can imagine what this does during peak hour in the morning. So I wanted to take this idea of vegetation encroachment and I'm going to use the application QGIS in this case. QGIS is a free application, a GIS style application that allows you to do quite a bit of analysis. And so the workflow here would be to digitize these vegetation polygons for the area of interest. Some of our AI guys might be able to do this in a different way, but I thought I'd start with uh, just the, the GIS method of digitizing vegetation polygons. We can export the DSM for our area of interest and then we can use a uh, statistical method called zonal statistics to extract the elevation values from those polygons used as an input. If we extract the minimum and the maximum height for that vegetation polygon, we can get what represents the ground and what represents the height of the the crown of the tree. And if we take that minimum away from the maximum, then we get tree height. If we then take a centroid for that vegetation polygon, we can understand what the fall distance would be for that vegetation area. So this is a site, uh, it's, it's around Stanmore, St Peter's. Uh, I, I saw that there was obviously some vegetation in the area, so I thought it'd be a good candidate to, to look at. And I've drawn the polygons for some vegetation along the side of that railway line. So just a simple method for understanding the area of the trees there. And then I've exported the DSM. Now, just using the symbology that's built in with QGIS, I've made it semi-transparent here. So I've got that true ortho product underneath, that pixel to pixel alignment, which means you can see what you're measuring and then we can visualize the elevation values for that content as well. So I've got that darker elevation being lower elevation, the lighter colors being higher elevation. If we bring our vegetation polygons over the top of that DSM layer, we can use this zonal statistics tool to extract that information. So we get the minimum value, the maximum value, we take the minimum away from the maximum, we have the true height we can then calculate the fall distance using that tree height as a buffer, buffer distance from the centroid of that vegetation polygon. And so we're left with this layer here, this buffered area, which is the fall distance for any of that vegetation that we've captured. And then I've just drawn this railway line to show the intersection between that vegetation fall line and our railway line. So it's an obvious area that uh, would require some maintenance. Now I know trees are changing all the time and certainly for some of the areas around power lines it requires a lot of maintenance and um, more frequent than just once a year. But what this can allow you to do is allocate your resources so that you can understand areas of low, medium and high risk and where you can focus your resources towards managing um, with more detail. I'm going to move on to the final uh, scenario now, which is using our textured mesh to understand uh, building heights and, and zones for building height. So I came across this uh, development that was happening in Cogra, and the proposal was for a building that is 35 metres high. Now it just happens that the OLS, the optical limitation surface for that area is 33 metres. 
So that means that we have a non-compliant building. It's protruding through that obstacle limitation service. It means people like Air Services Australia are going to be very interested in that building. And it's something that needs to be understood in more detail. This is the site here, so it's just a, an old uh, apartment block and obviously a much larger, more modern apartment block going in there. And I was looking into this idea of the, the different building zones and the different heights and how you might manage those and I saw that Hobart has a, a similar type of example and, and what they're doing here is managing the view. So in order to keep um, property values high, they want to make sure that every apartment at a certain area can, can see that view of the harbour. So they have a higher zone of building heights here in the back and as you sort of step down towards that harbour, the heights become lower and that protects that view for the different residential areas. Um, seems like a good idea to me. But looking at um, ArcGIS Pro in this case and, and this um, example in Cogra, we're going to export the textured mesh for our area of interest. We can digitise that building zone, so that OLS height there. We can extrude that up to the height and, and see what that looks like. Then we can understand what any non-compliant buildings look like. We can identify those or we can simulate any non-compliant buildings. So ArcGIS Pro with our SLPK format, that just slides in um, quite nicely there. It's got that spatial reference in, so we know that it's going to be sitting in the right location. We can create our building zone. So this is our, where this development would be occurring. We've extruded that up to the 33 metre OLS level. And then we can simulate what that new development will look like. So in this case, it's 35 metres. It doesn't look like much uh, on the image here, but it's about two metres and I did measure it. So we can start to understand uh, the impact of a development like this. And you can do this on scale as well. And I know from having spoken to Air Services Australia that there are non-compliant buildings that do protrude through that obstacle limitation surface. I try to look for them as I'm taking off. So that was the third scenario um, and I did want to highlight once again that we're building our next set of tools. So we've got that measurement tool that's in the uh, map browser now for interacting with our 3D content, but we are building new tools. And if you have an idea of what you would like to see in that application, then um, please have a chat to us. We, we would love to know um, what you would like to see in there. The story doesn't end there with uh, formats and compatibility either. So we had the online formats. We do have some offline formats not available still in our online export, uh, Cesium being one of those. We're also working with various application vendors for, for greater compatibility into those products. This is Skyline Terra Explorer Pro. It's the 7.1 beta version. There's a little bit more um, compatibility for certain formats in that application, Cesium being one of them. So we're working with Skyline there. This is also Bentley's Open Cities Planner. So it's a cloud-based application and I think there was a video in the plenary session that, that highlighted this particular scene. So that's a new application that Bentley is using and um, we work with them quite well as well. Finally, I talked a bit about the convergence of technology in the beginning um, of my talk and it's something that I've been challenging myself with as well. So applications like Blender and Cinema 4D that have been built around creating animations and visualisations, I was like, can we use those applications with our content? So I extracted some content and I brought it out. In this case, it's a block um, of the Melbourne CBD and this is the OBJ format. Um, I brought it into Blender and I started playing around with what's possible here. And it's true, you can use the animation tools available in Blender to interact with our sort of spatial 3D content. Now I'm not an expert in Blender, but um, I'm quite excited to see what 
some people will be able to do with our content. And I'd like to think about what the next generation tender responses might be when you combine some of this visualisation and animation technology with our content. Uh, I think it should be really interesting. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions outside as well. Thank you.